hello again. I'm back upstairs today. Oh, I do slouch in this chair though. So you're more than welcome and it's very nice to see you. I'll say it's very nice to see you again if you watch me, if you found me already and um, pleased that you're here. And if this is the first time, then you're more than welcome. My name's Penny. I live in the southeast of England with Pete and my five chickens. So, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, Goodenstone Park. I mentioned last week that we went there for the day and we had a super time. And um, we're going to go again because we need to. It's lovely. It's so close. It's so peaceful. It's so quiet. It's so beautiful. And uh, the little dairy there where you can have something to eat, is it's just up my alley. So we're going to go back again. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. The uh, house, um, I'm going to show you at the end, because uh, the film, oh now, I'm getting all in a pickle here. So the film at the end of this week is a walk around the lighthouse, a walk to the jetty and back, and the little bit of film that I took when we went to Goodenstone Park. So you'll see what I'm talking about. I, I show you the house and the house is um, for rent, for rental, available to hire. That's how you say it, isn't it? For holidays, celebrations, weddings and corporate functions. It sleeps 24 in 12 beautifully appointed bedrooms. And if you go online, and look, boy oh boy, are they beautifully appointed. Every room, every room is absolutely exquisite. If So if you wanted a big celebration, uh, that you, it, it couldn't be better. 15 acres of garden and parklands, secluded location. It totally is. It's lovely. And I wanted to tell you about Jane Austen because the original mansion at Goodenstone Park Gardens was built in 1704 by Brooke Bridges, the first baronet. His great-great-granddaughter Elizabeth married Jane Austen's brother, Edward. Edward and his young wife spent their early married life in a house on the Goodenstone estate before moving to nearby Godmersham. And their daughter Fanny later became one of Jane's favourite correspondents and Jane was a regular guest at Goodenstone. She was often entertained with dinner and dances and it's significant that she began writing Pride and Prejudice after staying in Goodenstone in 1796. Yeah. So in 24, sorry about that, it clicked off, it does that sometimes. But it says in 2014, the 18th century serpentine walk through the park was reinstated and visitors can follow a route which would have been familiar to Jane Austen when she visited her brother Edward. And we haven't done that walk yet, but we plan on doing it next week. Yeah. And so we've got the map, so we know where to go, and uh, there's the, so we're going to do it. Yeah, I've just heard my husband, I've got both windows open because it's so hot up here. I've got a front window and two back windows, so you don't normally hear any. But I, he's just driven up. I can hear him. So he'll come bounding up the stairs in a minute. And uh, that'll interrupt us. But never mind. Keep it real. My friend Son always said, keep it real, Pen. Keep it real. So it's going to be real. And that's that. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think this was the most expensive thing I bought there. It was three ninety nine, And it's a, a little map. Um, and it is waterproof, it says. Um, and it's... It just tells you the way round. So that's that's our plan for this week. I'll let you know how we get on. So moving on with some crafting. Oh, I bought a tea towel.
Nice. Lovely colours. So, let's move on with some crafting. I wanted to talk about Lynna Anderson this week. I've got one of her books here, Nautical Quilts. And this actually, she says, is one of her most um, favoured quilts. It's very simple, uh, but it's very effective. And I don't know if you've heard of Lina Anderson. Just to tell you a little bit about her, she, um, she has got a worldwide following, and that's true. Um, she's very, very well known. And I had the thrill of meeting her at the NEC um, when I went to the, the quilt show. Uh, not last year, obviously, the year before. And she served me and it was lovely because she comes all the way from Australia. She was brought up in Dorset, yeah, and she was taught to sew, knit, embroider and paint at a very early age under the instruction of her mother Ruth and both her grandmothers. And then she had four boys and she stumbled on quilting, a bit like me really, I stumbled on it, absolutely. And um, she just, she's very prolific. And of course she designs all her own fabrics and her fabrics are beautiful. They've got a style of their own that you just know it's Lynette's fabric. And I bought the book and as soon as I opened it, I saw what I wanted to make and I made it. Um, there's so many lovely things in here. A seafarer's journal and pencil case. Everything's got that little, and oh, that's why I bought it, because I saw this. I have to peer around just to make sure you can see it. So I thought, oh, that's for me, that's for me. I must make it. And um, I have. It's, I don't know if you've heard of Storm at Sea. It's my favourite. I'll show you that in another episode. I have, I'm making a Storm at Sea quilt. I'm piecing it at the moment. And I've also made a couple of bed runners uh, with, the, with the design. And when, when you have one square, that's, yeah. But when you put the other square with it, you use a piece of this one to form this pattern. So you don't, you have a diamond on the end, but then you don't put another diamond there. That diamond makes up the diamond for that square. And so it has a sort of movement. It's called Storm at Sea and it's super. It really is super. Anyway, um, normally you do quite a lot of squares to make it look like it's moving. But this, as you see, is just one square. And not only that, it's four inches. So I thought, right, I fancy that. And it's got a little embroidery around it. Here's the pattern. And I'll show you the real thing. Now it's EPP. Do you remember how I said you put the papers and then you put the, you can easily Google what EPP is. I mean, I will show you if you want me to, but at the moment, I think there's so many, you know, Google things to, to that can teach you, but we'll see how we go on. Um, but, oh, sorry, I pinned that. Here they are. Here's my storm at sea. Now the whole thing is four inches. I think there's 77 pieces in there. So you'll see how small they were. So this isn't something for a beginner. What do you think? It's rather lovely, isn't it? So when you do another square, if you join it on, in fact, my friend Heather, who writes the poems, she did put four of these together, no embroidery, but four of these together and made a little wall hanging for a friend. But you wouldn't put this bit in. That bit would belong to this square. 
And so it gives the illusion of movement. It's rather beautiful. So that's my storm at sea with a little embroidery around it. And then she brought it, and you can send off for the papers. Coast and Country sell the papers. I think it's four pounds for a pack of the papers. Here he comes. He's up, he's coming up now. I said you'd be up. I heard the car draw. Oh, okay. I'm not going to stop filming now. No, I've got the cheese. I've got everything. Lovely. He's just popped out to get some cheese. We're going to have a salad. No, that's the only thing they didn't have. Oh, they didn't they don't have do it. Art. Well, they do it, but they haven't got any in. And they only had three small ones and one big one of your milk. But I got I got the big one. I left them wide. Okay, so then. Nice. I'll see you downstairs I've then when I'm done. And all that. Oh, and the raspberries are on special offer. Oh, so raspberries on special packs. offer. <gasps> Four packs of raspberries. So we got raspberries and cream for, for tea. Some, yeah, so one. the other one, then she brought out another black, one. Black, I thought... Black, no, not blackberries. Um, blueberries. Like those. Blueberries. Pack, pack, oh, blueberries. righty-ho. That's specially for you, my dear. Oh, okay then. And Keep it real, of, love. I've Keep it real. guineas for me, so... <laughs> Dear me, sorry about that. Um, he's laughing. Now, this is another one. So she brought out another one. I thought, I've got to do it. So the two of them go together. And this is Love to Sew. And so it's so beautiful. She's often... She took. She uh, features her little dogs and her cats. There's always a little bird in it somewhere, and uh, they're rather beautiful. I did this in Liberty Tarna Lawn because I thought, yeah, and so it's the same each way round. But again, seventy odd pieces in it. It's hard for you to see. There's one, two, three, four in that. One, two, three, four. And round here, there's so minute. I mean, you can see, look, smaller than, oh, very small, but beautiful. I love it. So that's my two, Lynna Andersons. And I had them done the same. But a beautiful book, lots in there. And the other thing I wanted to tell you about it is um, if you Google... Now, I did write it down. Ah, Lina Anderson Free Patterns. Oh, there's loads and loads and loads of free patterns. In fact, there's a First Love Baby Quilt, which is... Do you remember last time I showed you Tumbling Blocks? And it's... It's just one piece, which is a diamond. Would be ideal beginners. Um, I'll put the picture up here and um, you'll see it's just a diamond shape. But you choose three, light, medium and dark. And at the bottom, you'll see it'll be up here now. There's a dog and the cat. And as I said, she often uses the dog and the cat. I got it, had it on this quilt, do you remember? Here they are. Yeah, the, oh, the two cats and her dog and the little bird. And so that's on the, um, that's on the first love, of, as you've seen. Just a little bro embroidery at the bottom. So I may do that for Tommy, who is my expected grandson. No, inspected, expected great-grandson in January. And there's a flower pot needle case, and there's a town square quilt, and it's a beautiful pattern, all free. Pages and pages of instructions. So if you wanted to try something without buying a book, or one of her designs, yeah, do go ahead and have a good. There's there's several several patterns there for you to choose from. So that's what I wanted to show you. I'm getting on with one of my whips. I haven't done any sewing this week. I've been knitting. And do you remember, I... Um, oh, I was going to show you the pattern. But I'll just show you the sock. Because I haven't got the pattern up here with me. But it's... Um,
Oh, here it is. Excuse me. Reaching over. Now, this is an organic wool from Garth and Orr. Snowdonia sock. It's grown in the southwest England, it says. It's organic. I mean, you can imagine how they have to source and know that everything is, oh, it's just beautiful. But what an unusual wool, because usually when you knit socks, say with this wool here, this wool is um, a beautiful merino wool. Oops, oops. That's all came tumbling down. Yeah, I love, oh, it's so, so soft. A beautiful merino wool. But it's got 25% nylon in it. So that if you knit socks, it, you know, it'll, it'll be more hard wearing. Of course, they can't put nylon in something that's organic, that's made, you know, without any detriment to the um, environment at all. Everything about this uh, has been to look after the environment. So what they do is they put a very high twist on the wall. And it, it well, it's so different to knit with. But Pete's put them on and he said, Pen, they're so comfortable. That's the main thing. And here I'm knitting him. <laughs> It's a traditional sock, isn't it? When he puts it on, that, that'll be the design. The heel. Plain for the bottom. And in real life, this is quite a yellowy wall. Can you see it better there? Yeah. I have to stroke it. <laughs> He likes it and it, it it's very, very comfortable, he said. So that's my whip. So I've started my second one. However, you will see on the little film, we have a foxy come and visit. And Pete found uh, the, one I'm, the second one I'm knitting underneath the tree in the garden with a broken needle. And I think when we weren't there, he'd come into the conservatory and whipped it out and put it under the tree. So I had to put a new needle in and pick off the leaves. You, you, Pete said, what's it doing out here? I know. So that's my first bit. So now I'm going to read you the poem about um, the mole. So I'll say, cheerio, come back on straight away. But I'm just going to get it up so that I can read it. Bye. No, I'm not saying bye. I'm just going to smoothly go on. You see, I said it wouldn't be a minute. I just needed to get it up so I could read it. It's called Janice and the Mole by Heather Greeny. Jan raised the blind and rubbed her eyes, then straightened up the sheet, pulled on jeans and jumper and swayed boots on her feet. All was well with dogs on form. A walk would help time pass. Then she looked outside in horror at a molehill on the grass. She pressed her nose against the glass, her brow began to furrow, as she saw a small black furry head peep out from neath its burrow. Blast, she cried, ran to the door and aimed at it a coaster, a loaf of bread, a jar of jam, a teacup, then the toaster. I can't enjoy my morning now as battle lines are drawn and I don't have any breakfast as it's strewn across the lawn. Sleek and black with tiny eyes, its paws like little diggers, this rodent spotted on the lawn had given her the jitters. You'd better run, you little fiend. I'm coming for you, mole. With that it shuddered, took a breath and shot out of the hole. It looked around, but where to hide? The shed was just too far. The wheelie bins were way too high. So it dived beneath the car. From out the door flew dogs and Jan. Her knitted cardie flapped. I've got you now, you little pest. You're well and truly trapped. The darting eyes, the drooling jowls, the howling as if mad, the gnashing teeth, the foaming mouth, and the dogs were just as bad. 
Judith cried. Oh, goodness, Jan, it's really got your goat. Could I have it for fur for trimming on my newly crocheted coat? Seek him out, the order came. You dogs must earn your supper. Your days are numbered, pesky mole. Your digging I will scupper. But darling dogs they proved to be. They didn't want to hurt this frightened little mole who'd introduced himself as Bert. Excuse me, please, we Bert exclaimed. My eyesight's very bad. I was heading up to Barnet, but have missed it by a tad. Oh, crikey, Bert, you'd better run. She'll skin you while you wait and make you into winter gloves. A most unpleasant fate. Robbie, you distract her. Go and chew the garden hose. Come this way, wee fella. And he nudged Bert with his nose. Concealed by Andrew's well-groomed coat, all free from mud and burrs, Bert set off like the clappers. His little legs were blurs. Down his grassy hole he dived to continue on his way. Don't forget us, called out Robbie. Next time have a longer stay. Well, Bert, in fact, returned next day. Just how could he refrain? He burrowed and then surfaced on his way back home again. That morning on the frosty lawn, with earth piled high and new, was a message made from molehills. From Bert. Thank you. <laughs> Again, Heather, a cracking, cracking poem. We love them. So I said to her, how did you do it? Well, she said a friend pot round and um, said, come on, let's have a bash at writing some poetry. And so, well, what do we write about? So her friend gave her three words, carpet, mole and pressure cooker. And they're the three poems that I've read. I read you pressure cooker, the carpet shop and now the mole. So there we are. My brother came and visited a little while ago, a few weeks ago now, and uh, she did write one for his visit, so I shall probably do that one for next week. I hope he watches. I did tell him about it, but I don't know if it's up his alley. Um, but we'll see. I, I might just say watch this one. But I know his daughter watches it, who's in L.A. So again, hello, Anusha. Okie doke then. So... That's the crafting bit. That's the poetry bit. Now I'm going to pop round and have a cup of tea with mum and I'll see you after. Well, hello again. I'm round mum's having a cup of tea and I'm going to be slurping. So <laughs> pardon me, won't you? <laughs> so we found, we've made a discovery, haven't yes. we, mum? And mum's yeah. reeling really, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. After last week, um, when I wasn't evacuated because my mother didn't want to, part with me. I was just thinking I was still living in Canterbury Avenue. I just don't remember. You have discovered from the census that I was living in a house with my sister and her husband and child and my brother's wife, my other brother's wife and mum and dad and I just don't remember living in that house I don't remember now you did say last chin wag that you do remember living in a different house because you said it was in a pretty yes. part of London Finsbury yes. Park which but when we looked at the census it's actually not Finsbury Park it's Clissold, Clissold Park. Park yes and so that was at the end of your road yes and the road was called Riverdale Road yes and uh, I looked it up and I'll put it up here so that you can see what the houses are like but mum wasn't living there on her own and and auntie May and yes. her daughter and and husband yes. living still in um the other place no Mum was actually living with yes, Auntie May, May yeah. and her husband. Her husband was a sheet metal worker, which happened my dad was. Yes. Yeah, not then, because he was he was only 13, yeah. the same as you, yes, wasn't he, Mum? That's right. You didn't know each other. But he was a sheet metal worker, your sister's husband. She had her seven-year-old daughter with her now. You were 13. And also, yeah. 
Your brother Alf. Yes. His yes. wife. He was away. Yes. In the navy, navy, like we said. Yes. But his wife was living with yes. you. Yes. Her and name he, was Margaret, but he, you called her Peggy. Peggy. Yes. And she was yes. a bus driver. Now, yes. do you think that was a horse-drawn she... bus or a tram? I no, wonder. I think, omnibus, no, it I think said. that was an omnibus oh, then. Well, they right. were just coming. Just coming in. in. Yeah. Yes. And Peggy was Scottish. She came from Scotland. Yeah. He'd, his, because his ship was um, stopped in Greenock, and he was on, uh, I think he was on a trip, he went for a trip around Greenock and he met her in Greenock in Scotland and they got married. I don't remember at all of that happening but she must have come to live with us, to live with us with mum and dad. Yes, so, and also she must have been there a little while yes. mum because she was a bus driver. Yes, so right. I mean it wasn't like she, she was unemployed or yeah, anything no. like that. No. So here's your mark. Well, how old would we say your dad and mum mum were? Fifty. Mum was yes. Mum was fifty four. I think fifty four. Um, yes. So um, she's got fifty. She's fifty four. She's got yes. her daughter and her husband and baby and seven year old living with her. She, you're thirteen, and she's got her son's wife living with her. Yes. All in this house. Yes. Uh, which wasn't a bad. House, a nice no, house. No, it was right. Yes. But imagine all the washing, because yes. your dad's job then, it, he was a light worker because he was 50, yes. in his 50s, and he was a harness, harness cleaner. A cleaner. Yes. Because so much of life then, deliveries were made by shire horses and yeah. other horses, and they had to be stabled, yeah. and I can remember him coming back from wherever he worked with his boots mucky, and yeah. because he was in stables or places where horses yeah. were were kept. So he must have, he must have, your mum must have had a lot oh, of washing to yes. with all that, with the children. Yes. And so then we found out that on the 1st of September, one and a half million children from London were evacuated. Yes. But you were taken back, yes. weren't you? Yes. And then on the something like the 29th of September, the census was, was done. done. Yeah. And uh, why was the census done? So that they could work out everybody's yes. rationing. Yes, so that yeah. they knew how many people were living in each yeah. house. Yeah. And then in January 1940, rationing started. started. And of course, war was declared yes. in in September, three days after. I think it was the third of September, September or something like right. that. Yes, war war was yes. declared. So here you are, Mum, yes. taken to the station with your gas mask, yes. taken back to the house, yes. and you got you don't. This is a part. You've got so many very clear memories. Yes, yes. But this is a part. Yes, that, no, that that is. Just in my head, yeah. Not, I don't remember moving no. at all, and no. I don't remember all those people coming. No. Something I, else quite traumatic for you happened because you had a very special friend. Yes, I had a very special friend, Rose, who we were friends for at school for years, and um, she was. She, her mother died when she had her, so she lived with her aunt. So she was evacuated, so she went off uh, to somewhere in the country living with pe people and she was able to go to school there. So she then carried on until she was 15 because mm. we went to Barnsby Central and the central school we would have stayed on until we were 15. Because it was a good and, school. Yes, and got, got so, our school so certificate. Terrific losses for you, Mum. The loss yes. of the school you loved, yes. the loss of your friend, yes. and also the loss of an, 
loss of an opportunity because you weren't at Barnsbury Central. You left school at 14 and yes. not 15 and you didn't learn shorthand typing. Well, I left at 13 and then in that... You left at 13? Yes, right. because of the war. Yeah, of course. And then in that year, yeah. the bit of schooling that I did have, going around to different schools that were open for two or three days or whatever. Right. Then I left at 14 and then my first job was in a shop and of course now I remember that shop was in Haringey which was where Riversdale Road was. Ah, so gradually piecing yes. it now. Yes. That's why you were able to work there. You lived near yes. Trestle Park, yes. bottom of the road yes. and you had... In a way, you had your family yes, around right. you, which yes. wasn't a bad thing, no, I suppose. No. Mum must have been very busy, yes. and your dad. Because you remember, oh, you know, your dad saying, oh, you know, he wanted a bit of peace and quiet. Well, yes. you certainly didn't have peace and quiet no. here, did he, Mum? No. Not with a seven-year-old and a 13-year-old, no. 14-year-old. No. And then you found your little no. job. Yes, and it was a job in a shop. Right. A food shop. Oh, okay. And... In those then, I remember the cheese counter being the worst counter that you could even think of because in the background, men then had to, and because there weren't the men, a lot of the men were at war then, so that it was a lot of them were women. Yeah. Had to skin these enormous cheeses oh. to prepare them in pieces in rushed for rationing for the public I got you and that was because now you go out and buy a piece yeah. of cheese and that's all in a box and yeah. it's lovely or yeah. you go and have some weighed for you yeah but in those days these big cheeses were huge great things and had to be skinned before they could even be cut up like you weighed. see on the shelves yes. of the people that that's make right. them they yes. were delivered to you yes. and that was your yes well I didn't do that but I helped to yeah, clear up obviously. and do all sorts yeah. of things yeah and, and then you're weighing out tea in yes, little bags yes. and sugar. And How big, all for ready for rationing. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. yes, that was... Yeah, because you were... By the time you'd got the job, it was yes, rationing was in force. In force, yes. Yeah. And the floors then were all really messy. Right. They, were, they were wooden floors, yeah. so they got really messy with all the things that were dropped. And Yeah. So it was a... And how much right. cheese could you have a, have a I week? I think it was two ounces a week. Right. Which you would probably have in a sandwich now. Yeah. <laughs> or a bit more than that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. two ounces of cheese. And if you were lucky, you had one, one egg a week. Right. But even then, if there weren't that many eggs, yeah. there weren't enough eggs, you, you, you didn't get one. So here's your dad cleaning the harnesses of the horses, your mum yes. trying to keep house, I would imagine. In their middle 50s, and uh, you're starting off now to bring a little bit in with the yes. shop. And yes. um, and you can't remember your sister living there with no. a sheet metal worker no. husband and a I, seven year old. I don't remember. You just that. don't remember don't it. Remember. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Don't but I think it was because maybe there was quite a lot of losses going on at the time loss of schooling, yes. loss of your friend, yes. all of yes. it. Or imagine how the grown ups mm. were with declaration of war yes. and how worried they were yes. and the decisions they had yes. to make. And it just was. Yes. Yeah. It just that year. Yeah. From 13 to 14, and even after that. Um, li me living there with them and I don't remember Peggy and Alf I don't remember anything about the uh, Alf getting married and no. her coming down to to England and we can't find London. the wedding certificate no. so maybe that happened in Scotland yes yeah Yes. So we'll leave it there this week, yes. Mum, and uh, we'll carry on next yes. time and see where it takes us. Yes. Yeah. That will, because later on in the war, in 1942, then, of course, we we were sent up, Mum and Dad and I were sent up to Scotland because Dad wanted to come out of London away from the bombs. Okay. And he was sent to Scotland, but... 
we ended up in Scotland near the Clyde, which was one of the worst places to be during the war. Right. So that's another story. Yeah. All right yes. then, so we'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Lovely. Well, that went well. We've reached that bit, you can imagine, with the war starting, being taken to the, um, you know, railway station, and then back home and, uh, and having to leave the school she absolutely loved. And mum kept that friend Rose until the day that Rose passed away. Uh, quite young in her fifties, uh, but devoted friends they were, and so um, yeah, it was a, a tricky old time as you can imagine. So we're going to carry on there, and it sounds like an amazing world away for me. I mean, nineteen thirty nine, um, but I know my aunt watches this, and um, well, I've got some things to say about Anne. Uh, that will be in my next one because guess what? Just dropping a few hints, she's written a book and it's being published as we speak. So I think it's coming out in September. So she said I can read you a little bit, but that's for future episodes. And hello, Anne. Nice to see you. I've forgotten what I was saying there. Oh, yes. So it sounds like, you know, when mum's going to go to the... um railway station it sounds like a mile away it sounds like so far away doesn't it but it was 39 40 well 10 years later I was born so you know from from then in 10 years look what happened to mum so there'll be interesting years to talk about and then they'll get more interesting because I'll be on the scene <laughs> no not really so, just our little fascinating fact. It's about, well, mum gets these bits. She she can't see my mum, as you know. I mean, she literally can't, well, but she's got this most fantastic magnifying. I, I've just bought her two new ones because it's her lifeline. And I think I told you last time, one came from America. I said, mum, we're having another one. So that came this week. So she's got two now and she feels, you know, it's it, it's like a walking stick if you can't walk unaided for mum. So she loves reading her paper. Absolutely love it. She's always coming up with these little tidbits. And what did she come up with this week? But the detector dogs that are wildlife's best friend. Here is the newts. Max takes the lead in locating great crested newts. Well, of course, they're on the danger list. Working Cocker Spaniel Stig Wright is part of the team. And um, ah, yes, he's looking for endangered great crested newts before building work begins because you can't build anywhere if there's a hint of a great crested newt. So what they do is they carry out the checks. And they say, similarly our dogs assess the impact wind farms have on wildlife. They help to identify and find bat and rare bird populations after installations. Our findings can influence the turbines being switched off overnight or at certain times of year to protect bats. Well, I've got a fascinating fact about bats. I'll tell you that next time. But for now, it's about dogs' noses. Here he is. Here's Stig. Or is it Max? Here's the newt. And here's the dog. Isn't he cute? I mean, how cute. But of course, the fascinating fact is, did you know that the dogs of dogs have got two parts to their nose? And also they're using dogs now to sniff out COVID at air airports, you know, the same as they use them to sniff out drugs. And uh, they're trained for many a sniff is a dog. But yeah, sniffing out COVID now. So that's uh, rather good news. 
but they've got two parts to their nose. I found it fascinating. They can smell a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. I mean, can you imagine? I can't smell sugar in a cup of tea. You have to taste it. They can smell a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So, when the dog comes in, he's been out for a walk, I've just cooked the most gorgeous, you know, pan of soup. I smell the soup. Mmm, I go, that smells nice. What's in that? That dog can smell every single individual um, ingredient. It's amazing. So, two parts to the nose, one part breathes for breathing, the other parts for smelling. And so that's why they're trained and that's why they're used. It's fantastic, isn't it? There's my little fact for the week. Fascinating fact. <laughs> so now I'm going to put the little film up. I hope you enjoy it. And um, I have been uh, told that people are enjoying the music. I subscribe to, um, oh, I've forgotten it now. Oh, wait a minute, I might be able to tell you. Um, Epidemic Sound. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's not like any other. Lots of other, they do free sound, but it's rather like when you get in a lift, you know that type of sound, or in the end of the phone, whereas Epidemic Sound, I love it, and I, I, I hope you do too. So enjoy the little film that I've made, and I'll see you next week. I, I hear a few of you are enjoying Monday morning that you can wake up and uh, it, they're going on a little bit longer now. So yeah, enjoy it through the week. So I'll meet up next week, same time, same place. Bye, take care.
Strawberry Hill, it's exquisite. 